Hello, Marky Dragon, also known as Marcus Eikenberry in real life, and welcome to another roundtable for Let's Build an MMO. And today we're going to talk about something called sea life. And I'm not talking about going fishing and catching, you know, fish in the sea or whatever. I'm talking about living on the ocean. Pirates, houseboats, I don't know, ship-to-ship uh, -ship combat. What's it going to be like? Messy. So. Uh, hello, everybody, uh, here in the Hangout. Welcome. Hey, Marcus. Hey. What's up? What's up? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, something that, uh, something that, that I have uh, uh, encountered in Ultima Online was that people role-played pirates a lot. And people were pretty hardcore about it. And, um, you know, they would, you know, act as if they were living on their ships. They would, um, you know, do other, they would try and hijack other ships, blockade them and different things. And, you know, it really was um, quite an interesting tact to, to things. And then, you know, there's another game that I played too, which was Command and Conquer. And when they came out with Command and Conquer Red Alert, uh, Red Alert had a lot of seafaring stuff in it. And there was a lot of ship battles and everything. And, and I think to myself, wouldn't that be fabulous to have ship-to-ship -ship combat and to, um, you know, maybe my ship is my home. And um, they could sink my home. I don't know. <laughs> Suck um, to be you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would. It would. You know, and, and then, there's, then there's also the thought of maybe something a little bit more secure, like a houseboat. I don't Why know. Why would that be more secure? We we're just uh, discussing this just a, a while we were waiting for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I am firmly of the belief that if you have a houseboat, it should be sinkable. Hmm. I also agree. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, without doubt. What about um, what about you the can... safety of your stuff? Not my issue. <laughs> if you're silly enough, if I kill you, take... it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's not. I mean, if you're silly enough to put your most valuable items on a sinkable thing, then they're going to be at the bottom of the ocean. And mm -hmm. maybe someday we'll come, somebody will come up with the magic to be able to travel down to the bottom of the ocean and oh, wouldn't grab that your be stuff. Interesting? Wouldn't that Underworld be interesting? Swing. Yeah. All of a sudden oh, there's sunken treasure. treasure. Well, there should be sunken treasure if that's where the treasure dropped. Hmm. Now the question is, where do you find it? How do you, well, you find found, it? You find it where you sunk that ship the day before. Yeah, but <laughs> how do you find it then? I don't know. Ryan, you I have a question. Underwater. Will my boat be sinkable in a location that's water? What if I make it in a pond or a small lake? Well, it depends on how deep it is. Well, you can hmm. sink a sh you can sink a ship anywhere if you blow it up. Yeah. It just depends how far it goes down. Sometimes it might be it's point piers. I mean, if you're up on a if you're up on a sandbar, you yeah, know. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't that be interesting that you know if the water isn't so deep there, you know, it's just like it's just like in in real life, you know, mm -hmm. when you when a ship sinks close to shore, it may not be fully underwater. Or when they hit a reef. Yeah. Um, so you get people coming up and looting it and mm -hmm. dismantling your ship to take the parts off it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why not? You know, there'd be a lot of valuable parts on that ship. And, you know, that would be a, a maybe a, a natural way of decay on it is that, yeah. you know, we see this stuff here. We know that that wood is very valuable. We know that there's that the, the nails in it are valuable and, and maybe there's still cargo on it. Yeah. And, um, you know, give so, you a lot of incentive not to mess things up and take valuable things there. Hmm. Mm hmm. Or incentive to have protection on your ship. Yeah, um, that's another thing. You know, whether that be, you know, cannons or magical or, you know, just like we've talked about, about a, you know, um, a fighter that stays in your house or whatnot and guards your house. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you could uh, hire some crew that will defend the ship. That's a possibility. I'm hmm. fine with that. And ships could carry a lot, which may mean that they are a good method of transport for, you know, large volumes of things. It also makes them pretty uh, fat targets, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do they deal with that Neve? Um, 
Freighters are fat targets. They yeah. die. They, they have die. escorts. <laughs> they have Com escorts. Okay. Combat escorts take mm -hmm. you around. Well, mm -hmm. that depends a lot. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't get that. They they fly their freighter in high sec, you know, thinking that they're going to get through without any problems, and then all of a sudden they're looking at their floating, you know. Well, you know, so okay, so can we apply some of the same principles? Like maybe, maybe you know that there is a you know a navy that is That's actually you know you know like um you know we've talked about some safe areas and everything like when you're at the bank that maybe that there's there's NPC guards there or whatever yeah. and, and you know maybe there are NPC you know navy ships or whatnot and they'll they'll go you know a certain distance out from the land but. Um, you know, they won't go much further than that. And so if you wanted to really be safe in your travels, then you may stay within so many, you know, so much distance of, um, of the shore. But you got to yeah. also make sure that you don't run into the shore. <laughs> or, yeah, or you could hire these uh, Navy guys, uh, and there could be literally unlimited amount of Navy you have, depending on what cargo you have. So if you have the most valuable cargo and a huge amount of it, you could hire 20 ships to escort you, or if you've just mm -hmm. got a little amount, you hire two or three. Mm -hmm. Man, this could, be, this could be a lot of fun, because then at that point, when you see 20 ships, 20 Navy ships moving with another ship, you know that they've got something good on them. Yeah. And you might have your 40 people in your, in your pirate clan that all have ships, and you'd be like, we're going to go looting. Or announce it <laughs> server-wide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen this ship with twenty escorts. Uh, everyone come with their ships to take this down. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Now, on the flip hmm. side, there should also be a speed factor. I think the speed factor should be a huge thing. So, if you got a really, really slow ship, you know, you're going to uh, you're going to 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 be a bigger target. If you have a really fast ship, that just so happens to be carrying some very valuable uh, cargo that dramatically changes the situation. But nobody mm -hmm. may be able to catch you. And so exactly. here I am, drug runner in Miami, and I got my Miami Vice boat with eight outboard motors. <laughs> and, um, and I am the shit. In fact, I got the shirt on already for it. I don't know if you guys noticed. <laughs> I saw that. I, uh... I was going to mention it yet. <laughs> this is my Cuban smoking shirt. Uh, yeah, Cuban cigar shirt. The parrot. <laughs> yeah, all I need is a parrot. You can, a, you can have a cat. Oh, well, I don't want my cat on my shoulder. <laughs> well, that so, depends on how big a cat it is. <laughs> um, yeah, or how sharp the claws. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I like this whole idea of, you know, we're going to need, you know, there's going to be, the, the land mass is not one just solid land mass. There yeah. are going to be islands. There uh, may be, you know, different things that are that are big islands, or they are considered continents. Um, there's going to be there's going to be commerce that's going to need to happen in between them because some of these places will be the only place that you find things. Like, you know, if we have a northern continent, we're not probably going to find many palm trees there, and and you know, be able to harvest coconuts. You may have to go down towards the equator, let's say, and um, and get stuff there. And, you know, if there is enough demand for it, you may take your ship down there and, um, you know, go out into the jungle harvesting uh, resources, dropping them off at your boat. There's a navy around the island, so while you're not at the boat, maybe, and it's, and it's you, know, you know, tied up close to, um, close to the... Um, uh, shoreline or close to the docks or however that's all worked out uh, that you don't have to worry about it too much um, and you know then you have to get it back to wherever you're going yeah you know, it's Marcus, just like the caravans if I yep. think the game is going where it is going with the boats I can already see a boat got blown up worth X amount of dollars or something like that mm-hmm mm -hmm. And Making the news, yeah, be like mm -hmm. an Eve, like hundred thousand dollar boats getting blown up. Yeah, and if they can make large boats as a guild player housing, <laughs> the same boat 
<laughs> the wow. guild lost its uh, its guild housing because somebody came along and sank their ship with a fireball. Oh yeah. And yeah, then they you have it. and then you have a drunken Rome. Someone is <laughs> drunk. That's the wheel. And then you have a goon. And then I I run it into a reef. <laughs> yeah, the sea goons. <laughs> Yeah, the, they the hang out. The sea goons hang out in the lagoon. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. It would yeah. be so. nice actually if we did have a kill mail of some sort, a uh, kill list, so you could actually see who's killed who and maybe if there's value to each item that you've, you've got, they sort of can see value of the character that's died, things like that. That might be a, hmm. might be a sort of, yeah, tough coding but uh, it'll be nice to see something like that mm -hmm, actually. Mm -hmm. I, think th I think that Eve has a great method of that yeah. and um, she um, ship costs and stuff like that and what loot has been dropped mm -hmm, but if mm -hmm. it's only applied to ships what about houses or oh, transports same, same, yeah, I think everything well you know transports okay so you know um, my cart was worth 10 bucks <laughs> and you killed my donkey that was another 5 <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, don't mess with my donkey. Um, <clears throat> His girlfriend is a dragon. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think... That I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, oh. one thing, though. Mm -hmm, if a ship mm -hmm. goes down... Mm -hmm. Unless the books are in a special container of some sort or a magic container, they get destroyed automatically. Oh yeah, things that can't survive the water. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That way, it dramatically changes the loot you're looking for. Well, like That's if true. Somebody's looking for books, or a pirate's trying to steal books. They're going to treat the the ship differently than if they would were just looking for gold or weapons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like mm -hmm. most food would perish as well in water. So any any sort of most nice food, mm -hmm. sort of just but like ore or gold or would be um, fine. Wood, um, you know. Actually, one of the things that happens with wood in real life is that when it sits um, underwater for a long time, it becomes more valuable. Yeah, but um, that depends on the environment too. In a marine environment, not so much. In a uh, freshwater environment where the water is very cold, it actually uh, makes the wood better. If it's because there's a, a whole industry of logging the logs that sank to the bottom of certain lakes, and mm -hmm. uh, the wood is very popular because it's not only very, very hard, it's uh, a beautiful texture to it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's all a, a thing that's just, it's like a rare item, yeah, exactly, yeah. High, high quality, um, very, yeah, plus it's so old growth trees. Chat is saying that um, that uh, storms could also be a factor. Yes, weather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most should, definitely. Yeah, we need. Yeah, if you can sort of be sailing around, weather is definitely thing. Because I mean, you don't want to go on a dead calm day uh, out sailing or out traveling to do transport, but you want a sort of relatively windy day where you can actually pick up speed if you've got a sailboat, which. I expect, wouldn't expect motors, but you'll have a sailboat, so you'll need the wind to be mm -hmm. able to do that journey in a, a lot faster time. So mm -hmm. there might be a, a nice addition to have some weather forecasting, uh, either looking at the sky and seeing the shapes of some clouds to indicate uh, it's going to be windy or or whatever like that. So I think there's yeah, there could be a whole factor of predicting the weather, so yeah. whether you sail or not. Wow. This is getting in depth. Everything we've done so far, when you focus, <laughs> has been in depth. I know. I you mean, know, this is this is going so much further than I anticipated. Um, well, there's another thing that you didn't anticipate, with adding you? the sea travel. No, not that. With adding the sea travel, you also have the lore of the sea monsters, mermaids. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ghost well, I, would, I would think that there would be creatures mm. out there that that would be hostile. And that, um, and that, you know, maybe the bigger ships are not really affected to them, but, but smaller ships, you know, uh, giant squid or whatnot. Um, and, you know, maybe that's all things that you would, um, that you would, you know, prepare for and everything. I could see a smaller ship, 
you know, and giant squids being a problem that, you know, when they put their tentacles up over the edge and so you put, you know, razor stuff up along the borders of your ship and everything. Razor wire. <laughs> yeah, well, razor wire or just, you know, just something sharp. Yeah. And uh, so that when it puts its tentacle up there, it says, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and leaves you alone. I think even sharks could probably damage small fishing vessels. Uh, just knock them about a bit and even collapse them, uh, destroy them completely. Uh, so even the smaller fishing vessels wouldn't venture too far into deeper water. So yeah. you need a bigger fishing vessel to be able to uh, cope with, say, just the batter from a shark on, the, mm -hmm. on your hull. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, you know, maybe that would be one of the things where you're really taking a risk. You know, in, in WoW, um, you know, some of the tactics that I would use is I wanted to get someplace, and, but I didn't have the, you know, the, the required levels or whatever to, to withstand the area. And so I would just be a nonstop run hoping that I could get all the way through. And, um, you know, so there could be some sort of tactic like that, that maybe, you know, if you get really lucky, you can make it all the way through, or you're really good at evading, you can make it all the way through in a little ship. But for the most part, you're taking a big risk uh, going too far out into the waters. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe there could also be a difference in vessels between uh, blue water vessels and uh, other sailing vessels. I mean, there, there's a whole different class of ship when you're taking... You're, you're going into deep water. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, you look into like other things like the difference between Viking ships and normal ships for that time. Um, Viking ships could travel pretty much anywhere, uh, up rivers, uh, across mm -hmm. deep oceans. I mean, mm -hmm. so but they couldn't carry a lot of cargo. Right, and they didn't typically have cannons. Exactly. And such. Now, they just will had there... really fierce guys manning now, the oars. Now, will there be cannons is another question, because that goes into gunpowder, which is kind of borderline high fantasy. There's not a lot of it. Well, so here's my, here's my thoughts on, on that, and that, um, that medieval is, uh, when we say medieval fantasy, that medieval is actually a little bit broader term than just those years considered medieval. There's also the Renaissance Age, which came after, which, which still has you know, the majority of the flavor of medieval, but has some of the finer details, some of the finer things, and has some of the just, just first glimpses of mechanical and, um, and things like gunpowder. Um, I wouldn't have such a problem with it, you know, with it kind of getting up into that range. You know, I, I, but that's, a, that's probably the line that I don't want to cross. I certainly don't want to get into industrial age or into, you know, full-on mechanical and stuff like that. I don't, I don't want steampunk. Yeah. Just discard the guns and replace with fire-breathing creatures. Simple as that. Yeah, I, I don't think there should be gunpowder weapons at all in in the game. I mean, I think that... I, it, when I imagine high fantasy, I imagine things like Conan. I imagine things mm. like Tolkien. You know, stuff like that. Where, okay. yeah, you did have some mechanical aspects there. You know, there were mechanical devices in both those series, but you really didn't see gunpowder. Uh, they relied more heavily on magic, which I am perfectly fine with. I mean, mm -hmm. if you hire a mage to, to come along with you, and he is, you know, he can throw his fireball 200 yards, mm -hmm. I'm perfectly fine with that. But what about, uh, like, really, catapult? Catapult's fine, too, but that takes up a lot of space, and it's a lot of weight. You're going to have things like ballistas, and uh, um, there, there's a few other weapons. Mm -hmm. I forget the name mm -hmm. off the top of my head. They're like large crossbows. Harpoons, um, harpoons or harpoon guns. Uh, you know, I, I'm fine with muscle-powered. I'm fine with, you know, basic mechanics. You know, long enough lever I can move the earth sort of stuff. Uh, you're going to see a lot of people relying more heavily on magic. And I, I'm that that's, I think, where we should more focus, like, the sea life because... You know, if you have a guy that's throwing fireballs to take out your, your, your cargo, you know, they're trying to capture a cargo ship and somebody's throwing fireballs, well, that's, frankly, pretty damn devastating to a wooden vessel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and you might want to change your tactics. Maybe you do. Uh, you have a faster ship and you come up alongside and you board them. Mm 
-hmm. That's like total PvP action in an instanced environment where everybody could die. It's really going to suck when they're shooting their fireballs at me and I've just been to Greenland collecting ice. (laughs) (laughs) The only cargo, they just melted it. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. I think it's be balance sake. Sort of fish, fish with sea life, balance between having magical and ranged attacks. So I think mm-hmm. a range of attacks and magical, yes, yeah, should be balanced, so they equally do damage. Um, so yeah, you can have a ballista or two on the ship to defend yourself. So people aren't just going to train up magic just mm-hmm. so they can uh, do magic damage, because that'll be a bit OP, I think, if you're mm-hmm. doing that, and then end up just having that to uh, be able to take down any vessel. And then people doing ranged or melee will be just basically not be able to travel on the water. Mm-hmm. Well, well and, and one thing that would... Thing, though, if would... you have a bunch of people... See, magic, I, I would imagine, is really hard to get up to a level where you can do some serious damage. However, somebody with a longbow and a yes, flaming that's arrow exactly what I was gonna say. Will, will be far more devastating than... Will equal a, will equal, yeah. Yeah, may equal a fireball. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, except it sticks. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, you know, you might not necessarily need a ballista sitting on your deck to to defend yourself. Maybe yeah. you got your your fifty mooks that are manning the oars uh, have two things trained. They're trained in oarmanship and they're trained in archery. That's mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. and they're really good with both. And that's it. And uh, chat saying that alchemists could have potions that could be thrown. Exactly. That's yeah. I'm fine with that. You ever you know? watch Whale Wars? You ever see that show Whale Wars where they they put the benzene or the the, um, the they're like real life terrorists um, and they they put this stuff to make the whale meat really stink in these bottles and they will hurl them at the whaling ships as they go by uh, trying to taint the meat and. Oh, but it's the same principle. They don't throw fire bombs, but they are able to throw the. They're able to get close enough that they're able to to lob these bottles um, yeah. over at the other ship, and they just break on impact and then stink up everything. They're like stink bombs. Yeah. Well, if you're close enough to lob something over, they're close enough to shoot you with a bow or yeah. a crossbow. They're also close enough to ram you. Well, so. that's what you get for committing an act of terrorism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe maybe we'll have smell of vision uh, in the game in about ten years' time. So well, it could wreck work. your cargo. It yeah. could be it could yeah. be a griefing tactic. You know, <laughs> you know. Let's let's just say that you know we talked about like elves in the forest coming through and killing people who are chopping down trees without replanting or whatever. You know, <clears throat> it could be a tactic used against um, people mining other resources that um, you know without renewing them or whatever. You know, that the stink could, I don't know, you know, I don't know. You know, it's really interesting, you know, the war, war on conservation, you know, whether or not that could be done. And, and I think that that's a thing in real life, and, and people are very passionate about it. There's the people who make money off of those resources, and there's the people who want to conserve them for, you know, the future. And that is a, um, it's kind of like a political Thing and it's and it's um, it's a it's an ethics and morals thing and if we can put you know ethics and morals into the game, I think that it makes the game such a deeper and richer place to be in. Well, we're already talking about a world that, frankly, if they even get like fifty percent of what we've talked about, mm-hmm. will be such a rich world. I mean, just in the sense of being able to do stuff. I wouldn't say it's parallel with Eve, but it's on track to be very similar in that mm-hmm. regard. Um, Eve was created in a time where games were nowhere near as developed, and it's managed to migrate to the newer technologies. It's managed um, to do amazing things is what it's managed to do. Yeah, yeah. and it, sh- it really pushed the limits of what people expect from games now. I mean, I... I have never played WoW because at the time I never, I I really could not get into the idea of, of, you know, the way it was set up. And I had a girlfriend at the time who played WoW incessantly and I'm like, why? It's so limited. And, uh, 
if, if I, I know they're not going to be able to achieve everything we've talked about, but even if they manage to get a good, you know, even a small portion of it, we're we're going to be pushing the envelope with the game, mm-hmm. and uh, I think the morals and ethics come along as as the players join in. I mean, the, there's got to if you can get them emotionally hooked, you can keep them, mm-hmm. and that that's. I, I think a prime mover in the game, and the the other thing that's that's sad but true, but is uh, if you want something to be, uh, if you want something to uh, be conserved, make it profitable. If there is something yeah. worth make it profitable to conserve it, to conserve it, so or uh, multiply it. For instance. Uh, if there is, uh, it's really hard not to be able to find cows. Okay, but you can't find tigers anywhere. Why? Why is there the difference? Well, cows are a profitable thing, so they breed them and they they take care of them. They make sure that there's plenty around. And you know, admittedly, you can't get the same things from tigers that you can from cows. But still, I mean, if you make something profitable, people will do it. Uh, mm-hmm. Alpacas, great example. Alpaca farming in the United States is through the roof. They're not even native to North America. Right. You know, there's more, more probably more alpacas in North America than in South America. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, talking about animals. You know, we're sort of talking about the wood elves have the same for uh, animals. So, you, if, if you call, kill a small animal, a baby animal. You'll get prosecuted for it, things like that. You'll get attacked. Uh, hmm. You could uh, say if you if you catch a small fish, if you don't throw it back, again you can be attacked by something a, a lot bigger. Oh, listen to this. You know, it's just like how you get your ships flagged in Eve. Yeah. You know, it's you know, because you take a hostile action, and, well, and so you know you lose your protection. Here's the thing, though. In Eve, there is a a mechanism where on your ship it's 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 transmitted globally. I don't think this should be globally. I think it should be a random monster encounter. Uh, you know, there's just so happens to be a wood elf nearby who saw you take the act. So you're actually going to have to look around the area before you do something naughty. Because there might be something there that will attack you for doing it. I don't yeah. think it should be a global thing. I think it should be a, oh, by the way, there's a druid in a grove, and you're chopping down trees near the grove, and the druid's not too happy with you about this. And the druid may attack you, may throw a stink bomb at you, may just give you a stern warning, a a stern tongue lashing, saying, don't do that. But the second time around, she might turn you into, like, a rat. (laughs) That would be fun. Or a rabbit. Ferret. Oh, and then it can be exploited for next time I want to be a rat. I'm just going to perform that action a couple of times, and boom, I'm a rat. No, 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 wait a sec. Chicken. Chicken. Chick- Turn you oh. into a chicken. Oh, I don't want to be a chicken. <laughs> exactly. Nobody wants to be a chicken. Reminds me of Dungeon Keeper 2. <laughs> Reminds me of Zelda. But either way, I mean, this is this could be a very... It goes back to the wandering monsters thing, you know? If you have the chance of a wandering monster, or if you know an area has druids in it, you're not going to to try to farm that area. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the the morals and ethics of the druid is to preserve the forest and get rid of abominations. Wood elves might think similarly, or mm-hmm. they, you know, might not care. I mean, as long as you're not burning down their forest or that you're not taking too much meat, you know, you're not killing too many animals. And then you might have a random possibility of something like a unicorn that doesn't really have morals and ethics per se, but just doesn't like people in its forest. Might just attack you for being there. Uh, you know, that is, there's a, a whole range of possibilities here where it's not necessarily a straight, you, you have been deemed a security threat to the area. It could be a, you know, a creature considers you a threat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where is if you had just walked right through, nothing happens. Yeah. yeah. Let's uh, let, let's bring it back into uh, sea life 
and everything. <laughs> and um, there be sea monsters. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've talked about uh, travel pretty extensively. We've talked quite a bit about combat. Let's talk about living on on water. Oh um, can we? Should we be able to take our boats? And you know, tie them up at shore and just live in our boat with some relative safety. I think so. Yeah, why not? I can't see why not. I mean, I, I guess you have, you can build a boat uh, just as you build a house. Uh, if you want to sail it out to danger waters, you can do that. If not, you just build two boats. Have the first one you live on, the second one you sail about and do your bits and pieces, collecting and whatever, and transporting, and the first one just stays docked up. So I can't see that being a problem. Maybe have a couple of buildings on land as well. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think you should be able okay, to. Okay, so to so let's talk it. about that. You know, maybe maybe that um, the only people that can build boats are people who have um, who have land that is adjacent to water. It's not like you can build one in the mountains and put it in your backpack and then go down to the, the seashore and place <laughs> your boat. Um, I think I think you should be able to. Anyone can build boats. Uh, people that do live in mountains have a boat in the water, and they can padlock it to a, a stake or padlock it to something to be able to keep it safe. Well, should we should we be out. talking about like renting slips, um, boat slips, and you know, and that there be you know uh, maybe a place that's actually you know a a place where you can build boats that maybe you rent time on the slip or whatnot so you can get your boat built and uh, then you're able to to you know anchor it whatever different safe places and mm. maybe if you own the land that you're actually able to secure your boat if you if part of your land is water like can we you know we, we've talked about owning land you know squares of land or whatnot what about owning squares of water that are adjacent to that land yeah, maybe that's a possible. default ownership aspect like you own a certain number of if you have a a land tie if you own land next to a uh, if you own land next to a river or an ocean maybe you have certain legal rights to it where mm -hmm. you can build a slip mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't necessarily have to be a linear uh, so it maybe land. makes it a lot more advantageous to have um, a river or ocean front adjacent property. to your land it changes the value of it just like mm -hmm. in real life you know because maybe maybe you don't even have to pay for that maybe it's just by default you know you have three squares out yeah that are yours and you can whatever. take and automatically build a slip there if you have the resources to do such mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if we've talked about you know doing the terraforming with the voxel stuff and everything then maybe just as long as you have access to water at all you can actually dig out you know um, a, you know, a, a waterway so that you can park your boat right next to your house yeah. or inside your house. Ooh, wouldn't that be cool? A boathouse uh, for your boat? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, this is my giant mansion, and we drive this giant-ass boat right into it. <laughs> Close the garage door, everything's secure. I think even if you live sort of uh, further inland, you could actually, if no one owns the land in front of you to the water, you can actually dig a canal all the way to your piece of land. Mm -hmm. you know, I, was, I was thinking about that, about you know owning land against a waterway, that maybe there's a lot of waterways that could handle you know medium-sized ships coming up in them. You know, maybe the biggest seafaring ships would have to stay out at sea, but medium stuff could go up rivers. And uh, you know, then you could build your, you know, your section off of there on your land. Um, well, here's the other thing. The amount of cargo will change the the weight in your vessel will change mm. the how deep it the draft is. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. if you have a big cargo vessel that has nothing in it, it'll float higher in the water than if it was full. Mm -hmm. So, it'll also have trouble getting under the bridges. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, it gives you incentive to to. I mean, this is like an extreme example, to be honest, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I mean, this is something within the parameters of Unity that it could very easily be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm liking this. You know, I, I'm liking the thought of, of, of having a, um, a vessel 
a big ship that would offer me some security that could be my home away from home that I can transport from place to place and that I can have the the ultimate security at home on my own land by you know building my own waterway in and yeah. um, and you know owning uh, owning that and so I can protect it because I own the land um, or whatever or, or a much higher amount of protection you know maybe nothing is 100% vulnerable but yeah. um, maybe just a higher amount um, I would love to be driving around a big ship and and moving cargo from place to place so I actually really enjoy that Neve yeah uh, it's kinda dumb because I'm just like okay autopilot okay 30 minutes later I'm there <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, Ching. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, I've just made some money. And here I was doing work at the same time I was transporting things back and forth. And, uh, oh, yes, by the way, I paid for insurance on the ship. You blew me up? Oh, well, you know. Yeah. Um, hmm. Sounds all very exciting. <laughs> yeah, no insurance in this game, though. You don't think so? No. 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 Okay. If you lose it, lose it. Mm -hmm. the it, it, insurance stuff is too advanced I think for medieval times yeah probably probably well then I'll just have to have two boats <laughs> and, and lose them both yeah. <laughs> yeah well you know and I can see too you know if I have the property and the equipment there for building boats then I could be you know actually putting together these large vessels and then you know have a buyer that buys it and they take it off into the sea and they don't have the you know everything to build it and so you know I'm providing a resource for that and uh, maybe that's how I make money is that I collect all the resources for you know big ship building yeah. you know and and my house looks like a shipyard I have ten monster ships parked outside <laughs> yeah, cool for that. Yeah, they're definitely to be sort of different size ships. So the people come along and and build a, a small in ten minutes, someone can build a small fishing boat, so they can literally mm -hmm. go off the coast and fish mm -hmm. off the coast, say, to get food to mm -hmm. survive. Uh, then you go for the transport ships, and then you go maybe onto some uh, naval warships, mm -hmm. uh, just to, depending on what size and what shape the the ships have been built at. Mm -hmm. Marcus, I have a question. What about creatures used for sea travel? Creatures used for sea travel, like Jonah's going to swallow me, and then uh, and then I'm going to end up in China. Maybe, <laughs> but I thought about giant sea turtles, sea turtles, or about two snakes pulling your boat. Hmm. Sea dragon. A sea dragon. Dolphins. I mean, that that could be a whole different level of NPCs. Uh, it could be. It could be a you know a, a a beast taming thing, and that um, you know so um, you know propulsion might be wind. It might be manpower with oars. It might be um, that you've got some sea creature that you've got a harness on, and you you know you are his master or whatever, and he's pulling you, just like having a horse in the game. Yep. And um, you know, and you got a big ass ship. Well, you need a big ass sea creature or ten. Big ass sea creatures. We're gonna name a sea creature that, by the way. Big ass. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I think I think it'll be good rather than sort of saying sea turtle and that. I think a brand new type of creature that's just been sort of made up from someone's mind or a few people's minds that can then be sort of implemented rather than having the box standard turtle mm -hmm. or or donkey or things like that. That'll be quite good. So something you don't sea donkeys. Some of these, yeah, something you don't recognize as a sea creature as such or as a, a real animal. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we could have yes. dragons that are swimming and pulling. Um, you know, just like there's birds that, um, you know, that would be able to fly along and that maybe can float in the water like ducks or whatnot. I mean, I mean I'm not saying a duck is going to pull my ship, but um, just that, just thinking of something like that. There may other be another way of travel too, is that you might be able to just ride your dragon across the ocean. Tame um, enough birds you can fly or across. <coughs> or Maybe. just have your dragon on a boat and he flaps the wings. Oh now that's interesting that you'd put him in like at the back of the boat or something like that and he'd have a big giant perch 
It yeah. would be an insanely large boat. And you can use yeah. the dragon as means of attacking. Ooh. Yeah, as your defense. You can't move offense when your defense is, is offensing. <laughs> but, um, you know, so you might slow down and when he comes back. but So you might be a little bit more vulnerable because you don't have your propulsion anymore. But, hmm, that could be fun, too. That could be I mean, real fun. number of ways we can go with NPCs and creatures. But the question is, how do we take and get those into a game or into the game and have it make sense for the game. Because right now, I mean, having a dragon, you know, flap its wings to push your sailboat, a mm, little extreme. Okay. I mean, I could see like a wind spell or something like that. But it can be a magical dragon. Well, all dragons should be magical. No, I mean that's... like conjured by mages. <clears throat> ah, oh, that... like an ethereal uh... dragon or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think all of these things are possible. Uh, actually, I know all of them are possible. It's just a matter of, you know, what do people need and want? Uh, developers already hate you. Huh. The developers have their work cut out for them. Just uh, to Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, think that we're, I think that we're going to see, um, you know, when the Kickstarter happens... That, um, that that we're going to see how much bang for the buck we're going to get right off the bat by how much funding it gets. If it gets a, you know, a, you know money equals time in this. Yeah. The engine's already done. Um, I have uh, seen in-game uh, stuff now, and uh, it's starting to look very nice. And it, um, uh, you know, so it's a matter of... Uh, how fast are we accelerating the pace of all of this different stuff? And, and what all stuff will we have at launch? Uh, and that'll be dependent on how much funding it gets. Um, but, you know, at the least, even if there was no funding at launch, there'd be stuff to do, fun to be yeah. had. So uh, that's one of the really nice things about uh, this whole setup here is that it doesn't require the Kickstarter funding to make this game happen. It's going to happen whether that happens or not. The question is how much stuff are they going to have in the game at the very start? Right. Well, it enables for more stuff. That's yeah. what it, that's, it enables for the content to be richer and deeper. Um, so, Well, there, there is a big advantage to working with Unity as the primary client engine, and that is there is so much stuff that already exists in mm -hmm. Uh, the Unity universe in the sense of what's been developed. Mm -hmm. um, they may only need to purchase an item from somebody else to make it happen mm -hmm. and then just plug it in. Um, there was the uh, Unity conference recently, 2013. Mm -hmm. and, devs were there. Uh, devs were there. And uh, the, uh, your guy from uh, Shroud of the Avatar was there giving a talk about how they they added they got fixes simply by purchasing it from the community, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. a, a very quick way to add things into the game, and I think you're going to see these tools really assist in how fast they can develop this. I think that um, one of the side effects of this all will be is that um, you know one of the things that's been discussed is that you know people make items like let's just say somebody makes a ship. And they they make it in Unity, which is the which is the development tool that's that's used on the front end. Uh, Unity is not the back end; yeah. um, it's just the front end. And but they but they design this ship. They design all the components that make up the ship. They design how it operates, how it functions, and everything, and, and you know what it's what it looks like or whatever. And they present this as a complete package to the game. The game you know, gods, devs, then say, ooh, awesome addition. Oh yeah, we try it, it works out great and everything. Here's your master blueprint. And that's your payment for, for it going into the game, is that you have the original blueprint. And if you are a good developer, you may have a one of an item type of thing. Because you can say, okay, well, I'll replicate, you know, I'll, I'll make some copies for replication of this blueprint, you know, so here's a, here's a blueprint of, of 10 copies where you can go out and you can build 10 of these and then 10 other people can own this type of ship. 
Or you can say, I don't want anybody to have my ship. Uh, I want to be completely unique. And so you have that custom ship that is not available to anybody else um, yeah. until your house gets robbed or you get killed with your master blueprint on you. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Um, uh, I think that it's going to be a great tool for the development because if we have fans of the game that, that even learn a lot about Unity and start developing some of their own things, we may find that we have people who have the talent to do this that have never tried doing something like this before. And we're going to end up with a bunch of fledgling game developers. And <laughs> the next generation. Yeah. Well, why not? I mean, okay, so Evil... Have you ever used Unity before? Um, I download it and I've played with it a little bit just mm -hmm. to, to try to understand how it works. Mm -hmm. um, I am in the process of reviewing the YouTube videos that show you how to do stuff in Unity. Um, I do not have the technical knowledge yet to produce anything worth talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, could you, if you decided that you wanted to make a dagger, let's say, or, or a nail, you mm -hmm. know, like used for holding two pieces of wood together. And you made that your, you know, your focus. You know, you could probably figure that out within a week or so. Yeah, and, and, pretty easy. And, and get yeah. it made. And um, so, yeah. you know, I, I guess the point that I'm getting at here is that two weeks ago, you, you weren't even looking at Unity. Yeah. And now you're talking about what happened at the Unity conference, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and and you know talking about what can be done with uh, with the tool and everything, and uh, so I think that um, I think that it's 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 both a really neat thing and a really scary thing. <laughs> but the stuff that gets developed <laughs> at the same time, the um, so let's say this person makes this ship. And we use it in the game. And so it appears in the game or whatnot. They can still take that asset and they can go over to the Unity store and they can say, I've made this awesome thing here, 100 mm -hmm. bucks, and you can add it to your game. Yeah. And they sell five of them to five other games. They've made 500 bucks on top of having the master blueprint in our game. Yeah. So... All the scripts are there. All you got to do is change the uh, the the uh, images involved. Because mm -hmm. I can't imagine there'd be very similar. Because well, the one thing I have realized about Unity, the uh, level of graphics is vastly different between games yes. based on what yes. they're shooting for. So yes. while that ship, you may be able to sell the 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 scripts to the ship and how it works and how it functions mm -hmm. but you'll probably have to change up the images but even then at, you know a hundred two hundred three hundred dollars to add you know just to drop this into a random game I mean that pays you know a couple months worth of your unity subscription right there because they set it at 75 bucks a month mm -hmm. which is actually for a developer software that is insanely accessible I mean, they're they're putting it out there. They're making their money off their subscriptions, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, I mean, if I had more technical knowledge and I was more comfortable with, you know, yes, I can do this part time as a side job, I would not even hesitate to uh, get a subscription. Mm -hmm, but I am nowhere near that level, and I understand that. And if you get a bunch of people using the free version, and I think you're going to see a lot more get developed much faster because if you have access to the tools that's one of the things I've been always pushing here is give us the tools to build stuff in the game mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. let us go to town and you know there'll be some things that are rejected because they just don't fit the game but right, I right. mean the this way you, you you're not just crowdsourcing the ideas you're crowdsourcing additional stuff in the game mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and I think once a community gets mobilized like that and they really love the game, then you're going to see the game become even richer in the sense of, of content. Mm -hmm. And that frees the developers of the game up to do uh, nitpicking of the Well, they do, they do leadership. They do coordination. They do, yeah. um, you know, they, they make decisions on whether or not something is good for the game. And, 
So, you know, instead of having to program it, they may be yeah. able to just find it. Yeah. And you know? on top of that, if they reject it from their game, that doesn't bar you from turning around and selling it in the Unity store. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So, so it's a win-win for everybody involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you can make something, you can put it up for sale. It's as simple yeah. as that. <laughs> and um, and so and Shroud of the Avatar is doing that as well. And it was, it's Richard Garriott you were referring yeah. to who is speaking there. And um, so, yeah, Shroud of the Avatar has, uh, they're doing some 50-50 share type thing or something like that to where they will get it put into the store and then and then um, then they'll do a revenue share on each purchase or something like that. It's something similar. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I've seen video from Shroud of the Avatar and some of the stuff in there, and it's looking gorgeous. And um, I just wish it was massive multiplayer like ours is going to be. Yeah. So that's so the only thing the about it that disappoints is, me. Is uh, standalone? Mm, it is, they term it as multiplayer. Oh, okay. And so you may be able to have like 60 people in an area, but it won't be massive like ours, because ours is going to be one world, and, yeah. and theirs is a whole bunch of instances. Gotcha. And, 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 and they have some really good technology on the back end to bind people together. Like, you know, if you put into the, to your account, your Facebook page, well, then it automatically knows who all of your friends are because you've shared that information with it. And... <laughs> And then your friends that are playing, even if you don't know that they're playing the game, may end up showing up in your area because yeah. they happen to be in that same area and so it puts you into the same instance. Gotcha. And, and they've talked about that with like LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, your followers and you know, Facebook, all of these things could all you know, be together. And I think that's brilliant because it allows them to be smaller groups but still have um, the interaction with your friends. Um, but ours will be one world. Uh, we're not envisioning making multiple um, instances or servers. And, um, and, and the scaling solution, I, I don't know that I have permission to talk about the technology on the back end. Then but, don't. but I'm going to anyway. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just gonna, I just want to say that, that it is uh, able to run on a platform that is huge, that is beyond any game that is that has been running to date, um, and it, it all has to do with the cloud. And um, so, you know, could we see, you know, a hundred thousand people in one server? It's quite possible. You know, have they tested it that high? No, but um, but you know, we could we could we could see five hundred thousand people in one server. It's just all a matter of resources, I think. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So, so anyway, <clears throat> uh, it's uh, I'm I'm getting more and more excited about our game here. <laughs> uh, especially, I wish I could share the screenshots that I've seen uh, of some of the stuff. Um, I just saw some stuff the other night, and um, and uh, I think that I'll be uh, actually in the game here within the next week. So. Nice. Uh, yeah, and we'll be recording some video stuff uh, to share and everything. So, um, yeah, it's all coming along quite nicely. Excellent. Yeah. So, okay, I think we're about done. We're about out of time. All right. Why how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> so, uh, thank you guys for coming, uh, for yep. participating, and um, and taking this sea life idea way further than I thought it was going to go. <laughs> well, you know, the the wider the audience you snag, the the more uh, audience twisted. you'll have. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. More twist you'll get. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. We really went far with the sea. What? And no, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, ink is funny. Usually, Just kind of. of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes. So, okay. Well, almost. Take care, everybody, and bye -bye. Uh, we'll see you uh, same time, same place next week. Yep. See ya. Bye.